I do miss the food there, though, but that kind of scared me. I definitely think I got food poisoning from something. Thank God I never had food poisoning. It felt terrible. I bet. You don't got to tell me, Tully. Yeah. That's the last time you're happens to my list? All right. So on Monday, we talked about in retail store the strategies that you have to go through in order to um, basically create incomes for success. We have two basic sides of the equation. We can only go one way or the other. One way is to increase sales, generating profit in one way or another. And the other is cost. And how we can control them. And for us, the cost has to take in. So we touched on the three calculations, gross market inventory investment and our ROI turn on investment that says we maximize every single pin that we can get in terms of profit that we have. It means that the, that we have to lean on being able to be efficient in the way that we manage our inventory and hopefully provide those goods that consumers want most. And then of course Next is gross margin to, to restate retail's goal, optimize and not maximize things. Remember, we talked about when we fertilize and fertilize an acre of corn, and that corn basically grows with the amount of fertilizer that we eventually put in. The whole optimization point means that at some point we get the best balance between the yield that we have versus the amount of fertilizer that we put in. If we put in more, the gains are not substantial, even marginal. And as a matter of fact, we might even lessen the amount that we get if we put too much payment in the soil. And so by this, we put more people on the sales floor, but we don't eventually put so many people on the sales floor that crowd each other out. So that's the second. The last is the gross margin per square foot. And that is where we put pressure on the supplier to be able to give us the margins on those brands and maximize every single square foot that we have. This talk basically our discussion today is going to be on in retail establishment. The buyer is an individual in a store, general, Walmart, any of the others that goes out and seeks to buy products themselves. The uh, is that they go with standard brands instead of store brands, unlike in all because those brands have bought huge lots in short amount of time and be able to maximize their profits by margins. And so, this aggressive use of buyers to be able to Please, every penny that they can come out is how Dollar General succeeds. I had a, a, a he's a senior vice president. He, he worked Dollar General. He's spinning off his own company now. And and one of the things that he talked about is this gross margin per square foot. He talked about how they tried to maximize every deal they possibly could. And and I'll talk a little bit later, but. Is the key to success behind many of the smaller family dollars, dollar generals, and dollar trees is this ability to be able to squeeze as much as you can out of every inch of property. Okay, so we talked about the cost side strategies. We're going to 
inside strategies, and guess what? We know all of this. It come directly from chapter two, I believe, in terms of service outputs. So if you were to look at chapter two, I believe, it was, no, no, excuse me, chapter um, If you were to look at chapter three, it would talk about the service outputs that each that form channel functions. These are strategies in the ways that we manipulate the service outputs in, in order to maximize our sales or increase our demand. So this first look at the time, there are really major of a retail out almost the definition of a retail. This, Take large lot, large quantity, and then they break it down into the exact size that was one. Um, and it is the fine tuning of those sizes, even the smallness of them, that make them more valuable. It's why one liter bottle can be ninety nine cents. It's all about and why a 10 ounce Coke actually, because it's actually more per unit than it is in a larger size. Now, some retail establishments, if you think of the way the channels are developed, they're actually kind of developed where they stop specialized intermediary of warehouses. And so a cost um, is an example of where the retailer, in essence, is for these warehouse functions, functions as a retailer, but it gives you the whole price because you take over the channel. So instead of and we'll talk about retailing as the most labor intensive one of any industries. Um, it saves an enormous cost for them to bring those in larger sizes and allow the consumers to be able to bring. Now, mentioning the dollar stores again, the dollar stores are unique because they offer very small quantities at very low prices. And because they do it for these specialized buyers. These buyers are aggressive. They find one time shipments, they find excess inventory, locations that may not be known of. They have spotters who will call them up and say, I've got that we need to get rid of, and then shop price, and it will come up with sufficient prices for the general make. So they're kind of really out in their own realm. So spatial, we've talked about before, excuse me, thank you. Thank you. Spatial convenience, all right. Convenience stores are basically for convenience goods. And these are for goods that require very the locations should be very convenience store convenience goods are generally those goods that you spend very little time thinking. In consumer behavior, there's two ways that people make choices. One of this is what's known as the central route. And this is where the consumer about what they're trying to buy. Usually these are products that require comparison, that require cognitive or they're items at great risk, financial, social risk. So who went here and they're gonna go buy a mini? And see, he deserves a laugh, okay? The social risk of buying a minivan is so enormous, especially 
which of course enjoy it while you're young, absolutely. Um, but it's the risk that you have in buying them that encourages those shots that quite simply are glanced at. You don't want to load on a convenience good. You don't that any what's called a peripheral route. You look for peripherals. You look for shape. If you're checking out at a convenience store and you're looking at the candy, you see orange. What is the first? Um, you're making candy itself, you're not making comparison choices, you're looking for colors, and that's a basic human shapes. There's a reason why the Coke bottle is the shape that it is. The Coke bottle is shaped that way so that you can recognize it in an entire row of other colas. Out there. Um, it's also the reason why. Pepsi bottle is the way it is, the Sprite bottle is the way it is, because we rec recognize shapes as equating with certain things of point. And so said that, the convenience aisle and convenience goods, they should kind of be required to change, and the location should be as convenient. And so, Depending on our lifestyle trend demographics. But the one thing we want is convenience, goods and convenience. So, what do you buy at a Walmart? Anybody? Groceries. Yes, groceries. Um, yes. yes. Yep, electronics, drugs. Okay, all of those. Things. George Carlin does a great thing with drugs. Um, probably drugs. Anyway. But then, anyway. Walgreens are pharmacies, pharmacies and beauty aids. But one of the things happened is Walgreens created 4,000 locations, locations across the United States. One of the things that they also did was that they tried to align themselves with general shop. In other words, consumers make track they're going to shop. And one of the things that they noticed was is that they're Things is the way. So what Walgreens said is, why don't we stock some of those goods and maybe they won't have to travel because the convenience of doing it there outweighs the value or the money that they would save by going to a supermarket and we'll make those trades. It's also interesting, drugstore, if you notice, um, one here in Boone is like right at the city going in once again. Shop. You know, right across the street, there's a TV. That purpose like store be separated, be close to each other, generate um, revenue. So they did this study. They had a beer and stand each two beer, and they were about 10 yards of each other, and they figured how to generate give time. Then try to make sure that the experiment is the exact same with all things equal. They took the very same beer and hot dog stands and they moved one fifty yards away. And both beers and hot dog stands generated increased income by like 40%. People want comparisons. They want to be able to have that separation and the feeling like it's not simply like something else. And so spatial convenience covers a lot of different grounds, not just the closeness of it, but the convenience also to another location, and that adds to the value of the spirit. Next is waiting and delivery. And this is a gives a job. Mm -hmm. 
Or large purchases and high risk, consumers are willing to trade long wait times to get better service out. But wait time, as I said, is it's the size of changes constantly. So in the 60s and 70s, the part of their company, literally, it's a pizza part. If you went into a traditional 60s or 70s pizza part, they would actually encourage there to be a light on the table because the light gave the supposition of dinner, all right? That's the whole concept of what a pizza parlor was. You sat down and ate his portion, but it was truly dinner style place. If you read, I've had been to a pizza hut, pizza hut, and it is literally a sit down affair. They have long drapes, uh, they have china, they have you know uh, silverware. It's a very different, unique experience. And it's, but what happened is. Is we've changed the norms on what we accept as pizza, and especially it comes down to the the places that didn't deliver first, they can say, and it's just true, you can sit the consumer sit in front of these parts than the consumer that's what they right? So I'm gonna change all that. I'm gonna in the seventies and eight had a brand mantra that 30 minutes or it's and that was a big but what they had to do is they had to be very clever they had to, be they had to put together a system and they had to have a trade area that could see them they could trade so less the huge risk enormously now to me if it's 30 minutes I'm not So this is how waiting and delivery time changes our, our norms, our expectations of how long we wait, you know, is, is one of the things that's on a constant scale of changing. Now, discount will offer no guarantees whatsoever because, again, if I go back to this, when you look at discount clubs or warehouse stores, they're like warehouses, or excuse me, wholesalers, and the expectation is you're not having to be treated as if. Okay. So, product variety. Product variety we've gone through before. It's the breadth of the different lines, the different this way. If we're talking, we're talking man. Relishes and everything that comes under that line. And then the depth is how many unique and different permutations of that. The next bullet I want to change because, as sometimes a retail variety assortment is purposely narrow, I would say all. Oh, because quite simply, you can't have it. I was making this discussion at Walmart uh, in the first class. Walmart does not have white goods. And I was told by someone who lived in Florida that Walmart has white white goods, by the way, are those goods that are traditionally painted white, refrigerators, freezers, those kinds of things. And they said in a Walmart in Florida, they do. I didn't know. But Walmart. 
part the general condition is those goods that are readily returnable. One of Walmart's main mantras is the easiest they can return goods. I think Walmart is one of the greatest return materials. I think it's Walmart return a good. It can be 30 days, no question. Ask, does anybody return a good at Walmart? Did they give you an option about how do you get it back? Get you back? Yeah. And what? Cash, yes. Put the cash right in your hand. Exactly. And I think that's brilliant. But that's also part of Walmart's appeal because they can do that because they deliver kind of limited. What they want. And those assortments are very much a part of the attention of time management. They themselves finding what's the breath of death. What makes them successful? Here we are back to this problem. A central role. More the deals that they what is that? This man, and he, he talked with our class, things that he talked again. Dollar General focuses on brands that are. New. And one of the reasons that they do this is that they're easily substitutable, substitutable. Which means that if I buy canned peas from Van Camp from the same thing as the canned peas from another. So it means that I negotiate strong arm one buy, be able to get a substantial discount. And one of the things he also said is, he never had a problem with late deliveries. The reason why is, is that he would say, no problem, I just expect a 20% discount on this. And he'd usually get it. So it would mean like, like one shipment, they could make a 20% margin just on the transaction. And the consumer would buy it at 5% margin. And the margin is then 25%. And that's how Dollar General makes it. They've done quite well into it. Buyers, if you can be buyers, you've got yourself a good profession if you're good at it. All right? Becoming a buyer takes time to understand how to negotiate properly. I would urge any of you who are going to get your master's to consider a course in negotiation. I'm loud, really, but good negoti negotiators are like gold to any organization. And then finally, customer service. Retailing is intensely. It has the highest level. If you think about it, if you were to go look at or film a Walmart in the day and fast forward, it's an amazing, delicate balance between goods that are moving out of the store and goods that are moving in. It's once again because you know I'm I'm kind of a um, nerd when it comes to this, but it is fascinating to see how successful retail stores manage this. So their expenses include the cost of keeping them on the floor. Pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, for goods or for items that demand service, yes, those mm -hmm. service costs are the item. The important thing is to understand in the demand based retailing strategy, you really have to know what services the consumers consider important. I am one. I'm completely sold on self-service because for me, self-service 
but it's just simply that. Uh, I can do it myself, fine at it. And once again, because I check myself out, it's also part of what's called the co creation strategy, where I create part of the value myself by adding my input. And so when Walmart, West Park, put in self service checkout, you having to find two people out mean that I sell. And so customer service doesn't actually have to mean servicing the customer and the needs that they have and finding some getting set. So cost side strategies, demand side strategies, and now we have other retail strategies. And these are kind of a tagline, which basically is a list other, okay? So in a unique industry, let's say, we can have two players that we can have such as a foot slot that has a high margin, doesn't need a high turnover, but specializes in equipment and especially this area. And they can have goods that carry. In other words, it's, it's quite other than if they stop building the particular piece of equipment, the pair of skis that they bought last year would be selling this year. It works and, and it works fine. And Academy Sports is known as a category killer. In other words, in terms of all sports, including outdoors, they might be, their function is to take over that category rule by price, price alone. Category killers break bulk, they reduce the custom waiting time, they provide a deep assortment, niche ones, such as a foot sloggers, does the same thing, but with perhaps a medium sort. And so, small. Of course, because you work. Uh, the academy, they're spread in every area or any large. And so these are the differences between a niche and a category killer. Now, to get to a busy little slide here, I may say. Just realize this if I say name the three multi channel retail strategies, mm -hmm. I want you to use these, things, right? So, internet retail channels, direct sell, I just a small definition. So, going through them, an internet retail channel, this was written in 2016. We're going to talk about the omni channel and its depth in emerging technologies and technology. But the internet retail channel is for low no locations. Is considered everything is on trading is done and delivery is done online is person -centered. and this is the category Avon Jaffra and Pam Chef actually with the Pam Chef distributors when I speak when Pam Chef and all of those others, you're not an employee of Avon or them. You are what's called a distributor, or you're also known as a contract. You pay a very small fee. It's like $500, and you're a representative of the things that they sell. And the way that they work is, is they create those kind of things. And so I'm, I enjoy cooking. I hang around my grandmother when I was growing up, so... Cooking to me is a release, it's a relax. And so I would cook something 
And then generally after that, whatever the products I use, those would be up for sale. Now, the thing about direct selling like that, however, is the money is not made on what you sell, but the money is made on creating recruits. And so if I had 10 people in there and two of them wanted to sell Pampered Chef as well, then they, they would come under my umbrella and then I would become captain, right? The danger in that, of course, is it's a pyramid scheme by its very nature because the money is made less with the goods I sell and more with the goods that are being sold. And of course, eventually you run out of the world. And, and that's why it, it's a very delicate dance. It, they, they're kind of gotten away from being so aggressive, but it's still the inherent uh, uh, differences. The last is are the hybrid channels, and separate simply bricks and clicks. It's a brick and mortar store along with an online store at the same time, and and you put those strategies. And in the traditional problem, they created an enormous, especially when the transition just started. Anyone ever play with Callaway golf? Okay, was it a U set or a new one? Yeah, U set. Yeah, I mean. Callaway clubs, if, if you're a golfer, it's like almost the Holy Grail. A new set of clubs you don't just buy, you get fitted for them, all right? They, they fit the grip in your hand. They look at your swing. They measure the length of your legs. They do all sorts of things. And once you take those measurements, Callaway um, goes and builds clubs built just for you. Generally, Callaway clubs are sold through pro shops at the golf courses. And what happened in around 2008 is Callaway started to try to sell online and erupted a firestorm because green fees are the way that golf courses keep the lights on. But it's the pro shops where they're selling clubs, selling clothes, and those is the difference between a, 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 a golf course surviving and really making it. And so you did have this conflict going on. You had um, individuals who would come to golf pros, go online and buy it. And that's what free riding is. Um, you even had problems with cannibalization. You know, and so what Cal Callaway did was they would sell to you online if you did measurements, but they would ship it to a pro shop so that you would make sure that it was fitted properly and the pro shops got some proceeds of that in so it was a way of coming up with a conclusion. The last part of this that we're going to talk about today, we won't talk about globalization yet. Last thing I wanted to talk about is the enormous power that retail has. So, chapter one, chapter two, we talked about how power was always at the top, the manufacturers, the distributors. And in 1996, the Harvard Business Review wrote an article that said power had fundamentally shifted forever to the, to the retailers. And that one retailer, Walmart, uh, is the one that fundamentally changed the game. The reason why, quite simply, is growing pressures that thirty or forty years. So let's cut. Kind of... Well, the first thing to realize is competition based on the prices that you sell. Shopping items encourage shopping, which means that competitors invariably fought against each other, and you have both intra-brand competition, is two stores in the same brand, then you have inter-brand competition, or competition between two different brands in the same store. The difficulty with that also is, is that we've achieved a saturation of retail in the last 30 or 40 years. We've been talking about 
breaking point for the number of retail outlets for decades. Well, it finally happened, and it happened before the pandemic. You started to see a gradual weaning away of retail outlets that fewer and fewer. The other part of that also was that the retailers themselves competing against the retailers had very little choices to find areas for profit other than to get concessions from their distributors. So if I'm constantly fighting on price, it means that there's a downward pressure to lower the prices. If there's a downward pressure to lower the prices, there's a downward pressure for the costs. If I've got this downward pressure to lower prices, the only way to maintain sales figures is to sell more. And so the pressure to sell more, it meant also that you had to generate enormous sales volumes of many pieces of to be able to maintain the same sales. So if I'm selling an item for hundred dollars and it drops to six dollars, I have to sell forty to sixty percent more to try to be able to maintain. And so here's the price constantly pushing the prices and costs. That increased pressure on these increased pressure. Buyers, people out there going out there, the buyers start threatening the manufacturers because the manufacturer to be the truth is the buyers have many, many options. Every year, there are 50,000 new products generated. And every year, only 4,500 products survive after the first two years. Now, think about that. With all that we know in business, with everything we expect to know, how we hope to create this they do, and yet still only one out of 10 items survive, it just gives you an idea of the pressure on the manufacturers to come up with this. And so what did suppliers do? How do they make this work? Well, the suppliers created what's called a Faustian bargain. For those of you, um, Faust was, it's a story of an ancient about a person who made a deal with the devil forever. And of course, the devil always um, Well, this is kind of a Faustian bargain. It's also an example of reward power. Reward power goes out. Goes out. If I tell my daughter, if you complete your homework or say, I'll give you a cookie. The next day, I'm going to say is, well, my homework's done. Where's my cookie? And that's exactly what happens. Uh, uh, um, sales promotions, excuse me. Sales promotions, talk about them in marketing years. The difficulty with sales promotions is there's the hook. Sales promotions are calls to actions to consumers to buy something within a given period of time that usually means a price concession or another. Well, the difficulty with sales or sales promotions are their primary purpose is to try to change you from your one brand to another. Well, the research shows us people still stick with the brands that they're loyal to. It also means is that you reduce the amount of income you have got from that item anyway Take the goods that they were going to buy next month and buy them this month. So all you've done is you've brought the future to pay today. And the other thing about that is consumers get expected to look for discounts. When have you bought a pizza without first checking the specials? No. Pizzas are the crime example. Everybody looks at it. All right. So here's the problem. These are the things that the deals that manufacturers offers to sellers. And they got caught and they didn't. So the first was forward buying. The forward actually 
not invented by Walmart, but it was kind of the the I guess it's kind of actually the the natural result of just in time manufacturing. Because just in time manufacturing does the same thing. Walmart would commit itself to let's say buying a hundred thousand items in a given year. But what Walmart said is you produce them put them in your warehouses and whenever we want them we'll like to us. Well the problem with that is they're collecting their warehouse having to spend that money. Um, I worked at Pioneer Airspace um, in the 90s and when we moved to just in time that was the one of the things that Mills said to us as well trade the inventory space. Yeah that's what we're doing. Um, however they called it the continuous replenishment program, Walmart, and it does have its advantage. The problem, of course, is, is that these specials or the bargains don't necessarily exist anywhere. There's a thing called converting, which happens where a wholesaler buy a large promotion and then ship it and distribute it somewhere. And these are the kind of deals that the buyer General look for. So they will buy in large bulks or they'll know in the spotter knows where there are goods that are in excess in someone else's warehouse and they'll use those. Wow. So this is for buy. So So let's see. If I can. So this was an interesting article. Um, this was put out. This is a white paper um, by a supermarket organization. Um, remember when we talk about we'll talk about conflict. When you find you're in conflict and and in a unsellable situation against a, a uh, channel partner, one of the things that you can do is band together to be able to have power larger group. So this is what they did. And this is a supply, excuse me, these are manu, yes, these are suppliers arguing against slotting allowances, which is basically a creation that they made themselves. So what it basically is, is it says that in every store, there's certain ideal locations where most people There, there, there. Okay, I'm not touching. So, what this says in any store is that there are certain areas in a store that have more traffic than anywhere else does. And so, what it says is that in these these numbers have those areas. So, those are generally one location. They're going to Higher, their their stamp loans. They have accounts that, in essence, create a niche that consumers. And we know that these work. What happens is, is that when all this gets checked out, and you know, at the end of the day, month, they'll run uh, analytics on it and show that more generated in these locations than they know. What slotting allowance said, I want that location, and the store said, fine, it's going to be 50 in that place. And if you want that, if you need that place, the answer is yes. If you go in the supermarkets, this is just a small one, but a big supermarket, usually it's the island, and an island is the end of every aisle. Okay. So those think about. Aisles are this way. They're passing the aisle where everybody does who's walking in. And so those get the most traffic. The other thing is, is that it's like five feet to six feet. That's generally another area that slides are. If you notice, cereal aisles is an example. The, the less expensive cereals, the ones in the bags, they're usually at the knee level and they're there for a reason. Okay. So, 
squatting allowances, as they say, have dis or not disadvantage to the store, to the suppliers they do, the biggest one is that they prevent small manufacturers reasonable access to that shelf space. So remember what I said. Retail outlets are saturated. They're actually fewer, demonstrably. There are 50,000 products out every year. They're all fighting for shelf space. And so what the retailers are saying is, if you want that stuff, pay up. And I am, I'm ambivalent to that. I have a certain ambiguity with that ethically. Um, because, well, one thing they started themselves, and I also think given that retailers make so little income, you know, standard goods, I'm not against it. Now, what I am against is this next one, and that's what's called a failure. So I was in Mississippi, and I had a store called Rouse's, which is the Louisiana based store, all sorts of Louisiana goods. But I saw on the shelf in the coffee aisle, black and white K-cups by a small company in a small town, Tylerton, Mississippi. And it was interesting to me that they had gotten such a good space and I wondered how to do it. It could be possible, I'm not saying it is, but they might have done a failure. So this is the way a failure. I've got a new product, I'm a new company, and I need to be able to be in a certain, a certain shelf area. And so they go to Rouse and they say, tell you, we will guarantee that you will sell a thousand units from like, let's say three months. So in those three months, if you don't hit a thousand units sold in all your stores, you can charge failure. It can be anywhere up to 25% of the original cost purchase. Now, failure fees are not up front. They don't have to pay them as well, but the advantage to a manufacturer is coming out new that you can roll the dice and you can hopefully be able to make a success. So here's the moral dilemma. It is possible and conceivable that a supermarket that might investing in the failure of that item may not fail due to its inferiority. It not, may not fail from its lack of appeal, but it could just be possible that the retailer is supporting it. That's it. And so these devices, however necessary they are, um, are ways in which the retailer generate money and sometimes quite successfully not in favor of this. So there's one more, one more left, and that has to go with our friends at Aldi. So Aldi is a very unique, special brand. All right. So, if you've ever been in an well, the three quarters their own company brands, and then they have some national. But one of the things that they do is they really skirt copyright infringement. They, they design, position their goods. So, remember, all right, convenience goods or other goods like that, consumers use the peripheral. Right? And so they're looking at color. Look at that. Look at that. And the boy, that's, that's really, look at the race. Okay. I mean, that's no, I mean, the thing about copyright, especially with shapes and colors, if it is 25% different, and how you do, no idea. But if it's 25% different, then it doesn't infringe. This is the way 
that, um, excuse me, CBS owned the right to start. And Paramount was able to create the new Star Trek Discovery by making their uniforms so different that they, in essence, did not. That's the way they said. But having said that, Aldi has been very successful with their store brands for a big reason, a huge one. Store brands are private labor brands, excuse me, are very money safe, very popular in Europe, becoming more and more popular now. They're a close substitute for branded products. And usually we're talking about products that tend to be generic in nature, canned peas, corn, those kind of things. You might even see on a Sam's Choice can, if you turn it around, it might say canned by Van Camp. That's very possible, right? It's very possible that a Van Camp can of corn right next to a Sam's Choice may have come from the same factory. But what's the difference? The difference is, is that the one with the brand that says Van Camp, they make a 2% margin on And the one that says Sam's Choice make a 35%. Door brands are very valuable and they help stores survive. So that's why you see it. I think Aldi has done a great job um, in the United States, there's a group called IGA, Independent Grocers Association. They're headquartered by St. Louis. They kind of bought up all of the supermarkets that went out of business when Walmart started taking over. And they have a thing called Save-A-Lot. And Save-A-Lot is very much in the same format of Aldi in that they sell mostly store brands. And you find them in very small communities, 1,500 or it works, successful, it go on for a while. All right, we're going to leave that here. I have no more voice. Um, if you have any more things to turn in for the job fair, let me know. Um, I'll accept anything up until Friday. Have a great week, and I'll see you later.